Set 11 Inkborn Fables may have been the best TFT launch patch ever. We saw multiple metas shift on a daily basis, from Fast 9 to Reroll to Forecast and other cool comps that you can only play if you knew the condition. But it was far from perfect. And so 14.7 is a brand new patch. There's a lot of big changes, but what are the best comps? Let's go ahead and dive into the TFT Academy tier list to find out. So hot off the press for TFT Academy's tier list on patch 14.7b. This was updated just a few minutes ago, and we update it multiple times a day usually to give you the most up-to-date information. Starting off at the top of S tier, we have Heavenly Yone. Still the best comp of the game, even after the nerf to Yone on the B patch, which has reduced his shields and also increased his mana. Yone is still really good, and that's because Yone is just hard carried by the fact that Heavenly gives you so many stats. Heavenly as a trait is really powerful because it gives you extra omni vamp because they buffed the emblem wukong's attacks we got nerfed but it's still really insane get extra hp resistances so on and so forth and so it feels like yone actually has like 10 items he's got the two titans and the bt you get support items for him you get triple combat augments you get heavenly trait for reaper and it's just there's too much to take him down in fact i played a game immediately after the b patch and won with just yone 2 pushing levels and hitting seven heavenly because I hit a heavenly emblem. Yone is harder to stabilize on because you get nerfed. And so if you don't have a good Yone spot, you're likely to get more punished. But he's still, in my opinion, the best comp of the game right now. Although maybe that changes as people get better at optimizing certain boards. Usually that's how you beat other Yone players. If you're contested, you try to play high tempo, you're over leveled than them and you wait for them to die. And you could roll for Yone three on eight, for example, while playing around like Kane two. Don't forget things like armor reduction through even shroud and last whisper. Last whisper probably goes on Kane. And uh, remember about the heavenly prio Soraka is the least important unit because her stats don't add that much to Yone. But, you know, getting seven heavenly is really nice and her mana reeve is pretty good. So something to play at probably nine. There's also so many other variations of Yone. This is the strongest, but I made an entire video talking about how to play Yone from multiple different positions if you want to one trick him. So uh, definitely check out the video if you want the long full explanation on Yone. Second, we have Duelist reroll. Duelist is really powerful because Volibear is kind of just a threat at all points of the game. If you get Volibear one very early, Volibear might be the best stage two champion just in the game period. And if you get a Titans and BT on him, he is extremely powerful. So things like Gargantuan Resolve is uh, not listed, but it's really, really good. Uh, add Gargantuan Resolve on top of the list of many other augments that Duelists really love. You might be wondering like why his combat catch is so good, but remember that attack speed with Duelist helps you cast more often. So this combat that caster is actually uh, activating very, very often, giving you a ton of shielding, which scales off the damage reduction from the Duelist trait. A lot of people may be wondering, do you only play Duelist with a plus one? And I don't actually think that's true. The reality is you just need Tristana 3 and Volibear 3 as fast as you can. Don't forget armor reduction as well. Last Whisper is really good on Tristana. Even Shroud on Lee Sin slash Diana. A lot of people think that because you have Irelia with Sunders, you're like, oh, I don't need Last Whisper or Even Shroud at all. And that could be true. Especially if you're playing on portals that guarantee you Irelia, like Champion Conference. But in general, make sure that you still have the usual core utility built, like anti-heal and anti-armor. Uh, best holder early are Yasuo and Darius. They're just very, very good uh, with Titans BT. And you can play a very strong tempo game all throughout. Surprisingly, I think Volibear 3 is more important than Tristana 3. If you get Volibear 2, Tristana 3, you can definitely bot 4. But I've seen Volibear 3 and then like Irelia 2, Tristana 2. Lee Sin 2 with items can actually do a lot of damage as well. Don't really sleep on the Lee Sin. One thing I didn't mention is Fine Vintage is really, really good on Duelists because you can get things like extra resistances and shielding, which is really powerful with the damage reduction. So stack things like Locket and Aegis. Don't stack Zeke so you get a lot of attack speed. It's less important. You can also still do the Zizirot cheese, but it's not nearly as effective because you're not playing uh, much Heavenly. Seven Faded is back on being on top. I think Seven Faded was a little bit falling off because of other things like Ghostly and Yone's backline axis just threatened the Aphelios before he can ramp up or even Syndra for that matter. But now that's been nerfed and people, you know, once again are starting to realize that Seven Faded itself, the trait hasn't been affected. Only Thresh has gotten nerfed. Yasuo has gotten nerfed, but not Seven Faded. That just means that this comp is still really strong if you can get it online. Play with the usual stuff. Uh, Faded plus one is really good. If you have an excuse to reroll Aphelios, go for it, but you don't have to. You can just play Aphelios 2, Singer 2, get to 9, 
hit set two and just generally have a really strong board. One thing worth noting is that Baboom is actually bugged on Aphelios. When Aphelios cast, the game thinks that it's casting twice. So Aphelios gets the immediate 75% damage boost, which is very OP. So if you end up finding Baboom while playing Faded, make sure to pick that up. Most important items for Aphelios is Rage Blade or Attack Speed. Um, if you don't have Rage Blade, but you have like Pumping Up, you can definitely get away with like having other items on Aphelios. And then make sure you can stack Syndra with some of the appropriate resources resistant shred and anti-heal ghostly senna is also still really strong and kind of depends a little bit on your tattoos i personally think tattoo protection is just way better than everything else because it gives senna what she wants which is stalling frontline and remember ghostly as a trait it's better as there's more ghosts stacking up onto a unit this version actually forgot the ghost emblem uh ghost emblem just probably goes on Jax here until you find udir and then you place udir over Jax. that way you get the behemoth over shen and then you could probably play another unit like orn in the meantime but if you don't get tattoo make sure you just pick up like an offensive one like bombardment and fury on senna and i guess toxin if you have tattoo of vitality probably don't reroll senna unless you get like the god god tier augments like two healthy or ghostly plus one and like you know the other really obnoxiously good stuff rage blade can do really well for senna early but in my opinion i think red buff is a little bit better just gives her that attack speed that she really wants that attack speed is actually relevant because towards the end of the fight senna is actually killing by auto attacking and not actually casting anymore because the ghosts just make your auto attacks hit really hard so she just attacks twice and kills that's why attack speed kind of matters especially towards the late end of the fight but red buff is uh two for one it gives you the attack speed and gives you that anti-heal there's also a couple of other ways that you could play around this as well if you get like an ink shadow plus one you can try to play for seven ink shadow and play around kaisa and senna duo that's a different variation that we'll talk about in a little bit but i think that's less consistent so uh try not to go for that that often ghostlies do want to be positioned very closely to each other because who they attack stacks the ghost onto them so just keep that in mind uh the positioning here for example if you want to stack ghost onto a single target is kane moves to the left have the ghostly emblem on jacks and then have all of these units kind of focus the same two units basically and then the really cool thing is that you can actually pivot into Kaisa, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. All right, four trick shot Kaisa. This is something that you can transition if Ghostly Center Reroll is not going well, like you are not hitting or you're contested and you have things like, you know, Blast Whisper slammed and you're like ready to go into Senna, but you know, you get dropped to Kaisa and then let's say you're playing like, you know, one of those encounters that encourages the level or maybe just, you know, someone else has like six Kaisas and pivots in your comp randomly. You can play four trick shot Kaisa instead. Kaisa just really needs frontline and the simplest frontline you can play is kaisa that links with atrox because of the ink shadow connection and then riven galio with sivir for the story weaver connection so you might as well just play four bruisers at that point and you might as well just go with you know udir for the ink shadow at that so i think when you put this all together it's a really strong comp and it tempos really well the real trick and finesse is when you can go to level nine this comp if you stay at eight is going to struggle a lot it reminds me of disco from the previous set in remix rumble if you played disco and you played twist of fate and blitzcrank 2 but you were stuck on level eight didn't get access to some of those five costs you would struggle in the same way i think this composition is a completely different animal when it gets to zaya and and has Udir because then Udir becomes a really big warrior threat and Zaya becomes a secondary DPS burst, which could be huge. So try your best to navigate that. Usually in the ideal scenario, you're hitting Galio 2 and Kaisa 2 really easily and pushing 9. There are scenarios where you can probably stabilize on Galio 2, Kaisa 1, but that's case by case and it kind of depends on things like your augment setup. You really want combat augments. That's what really makes Kaisa really insane. Uh, you have Kaisa bursting like crazy if you have Jeweled Lotus or Lucky Ricochet. Things like Little Buddies is nice because you're playing so many two cost units. Another thing to consider is that Kaisa wants to focus fire high priority units so you want kaisa to be in front of yone for example yone as we said like positions in the front center a lot of times because he's hard to kill with so many stacks of stats kaisa wants to be in front of him she focus fires and then her ability is able to finish it off with her immense amount of burst Kaisa's a really big ad nuker so try to use her physical damage to kill high prior targets really quickly don't have her focus the weak units first. You also don't have to play Ink Shadow to curve into this. You can play Story Weaver uh, with Teemo being the item holder. You have Teemo hold like a lot of stuff and then transition out of it. Just remember that you do want four trick shot because it is a significant DPS increase. Down to the A tier, we got the Fast Nines to start things off. Fast Nine is hard to pull off because for the most part, unless you're super duper win streaking, like winning stage two, three, and maybe the early parts of stage four, it's very hard to reliably pull it off. And the main way people have been using to get there right now is fortune openings, having 
like a pretty decent cash out or going for a mega cash out, stabilizing very quickly on eight and then going to nine. And so I would say that in general, this is no longer in S tier. It does end up winning a lot of games. It's just kind of hard to get there and you can't play it as often as you would like. Rerolls are just going to punish you really, really hard. But if you're able to win streak, get a lot of like high E EXP augments like Slammin', Cluttered Mind, even things like Epoch that get you stable all throughout different parts of the game. It's going to be pretty strong and hard to stop. Once a fast nine player gets Irelia and Hui online, Line. very hard to keep up with that dps if your front line is matching theirs and so you really need to kill them before they get this online the key to this composition is breaking it down into three sections you want irelia and Huey, your damage you really want good front line which is like in this case galio or sometimes you're playing like orn and udir or other things like that and a good warrior like a melee carry to help threaten back line and to help add that extra dps to clean up that front line rakan and wukong are the best but sometimes you have items on like a silas or maybe you hit Kane 2 and you're playing around that to help you get to 9. Those kinds of, you know, melee carries can help you clutch certain spots uh, in order to transition to 9. So uh, make sure you're playing around them as best as you can. There's a lot of variations of Fast 9. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead and pull up the other one as well because Hui Azir is like the AP focused one. So instead of Irelia, you're focusing on Azir and you're kind of playing around a different set of packages but uh it, it's it's all very interchangeable and all kind of depends on your items and it's very fluid if you have things like giant slayer and gunblade and rage blade that can be played on pretty much anybody and that's what makes fast nine really fun but also very hard right we have this as hard on both and that might be underselling it these might be the most difficult things to play in the game consistently because it all kind of depends on what you're hitting what packages are available what your augments are looking like how much hp you have things of that sort if you want more information about fast nine i made a video about it featuring brosif and how he hit masters in like two to three days off the new set but the new variation of fast nine tends to lean more towards irelia and that's a lot more what setsuko's playing i'll probably make a video on Setsuko's Fast 9, so keep an eye out for that soon. Moving down A tier, we got Fine Vintage. Fine Vintage is probably the most fun and meme comp they've printed in quite some time, where Fine Vintage gives you stacking stats to support Void Spawns and Zeroth Portals to win the game. Basically, you just win through an overwhelming amount of stats because of the support items and because of Heavenly. So you get like a ton of extra HP from Nico, a ton of extra resistance from Malphite, a ton of extra AD from Kiana. Give them Zeke's and lock it and just watch Void Spawns walk to the back because there's just not enough frontliners to hold them off. And then Void Spawn just like assassinates the back line while Irelia and Lissandra uh, kind of whale on everything. Sandra's really good for printing items. I really uh, just DPSs everything down. Uh, the hard part is when you're not hitting void spawns, usually the magic number is two. If you have only one Zeus Rot, you're going to struggle a lot. Might be in that situation where you hit like a gem and like a Zephyr and like one Aegis, one Zeus Rot. You're like, oh my God, this is not that good. I just die. Uh, that can be really difficult. And they also nerf find vintage. It's no longer S tier because it doesn't work on PV rounds before. You used to make items on a bench unit as fast as you could so you can bank in one round but now that doesn't count and so uh now it's harder to pull it off but still really good if you can get there that critical mass it, it feels kind of like similar to fast nine if you get to a certain tipping point you cannot be beaten and it just will win out the rest of the game unless someone has like something crazy like a three star four cost so the finesse of this comp is oftentimes trying to survive that phase because the more items you get the more you scale remember to have anti-heal on irelia and remember that you want to pair your support items together, like Locket and Zeke's and Aegis and Randuin's. I also made another video on Fine Vintage, a fantastically fun augment. If you haven't tried it yet, go for it. And if you go eighth, try again, because I promise you winning like this is nothing like any other comp in TFT. Blue Kale for Seven Story Weaver has gotten buffed. The new variation that people play for Kale after the B patch is green, blue, blue for the most effective amount of shred plus AOE burst. A lot of times what you're doing with seven story weaver and blue is just trying to tempo. You try to like curve out by hitting a story weaver plus one. So on stage two, you're hitting five story weaver on early stage four, you hit seven story weaver, maybe even before that, if you're able to push levels and find an early Galio, and then you get to nine and play Irelia, the best DPS unit in the game and have Kale be your secondary damage source. The other thing about Kale that we kind of discovered was that you could put her in the front two rows. That was what got B-Patched because she was hitting backline. That has changed, so I'm not entirely sure if you want Kale to be as high up, but that might be something that changes more and more depending on people experimenting. What was going on before the B-Patch was that people would front row the Kale, 
KO's second wave would go past the target she was hitting and then nuke the backline and pop them in one burst. Now they fix that, and KO still does a lot of damage with Skull Force because they bug fixed her, but uh, they nerfed Tome of Power, so it's a little bit less good. Uh, you also can reroll if you do end up getting like a lot of, you know, Zoe's and Zyra's and stuff like that. You could end up chasing like reroll Story Weaver, which does buff the KO, but uh, that's a little bit hard to pull off and a little bit more niche. Kogma reroll is still really solid. His nerf actually didn't go through the original patch. So the B patch was nerfing him the way he was supposed to. Kog'Maw basically takes one extra cast now to extend his range. It's now every three casts instead of two. So now Kog'Maw is no longer reaching backline as quickly. And that's kind of a big deal in certain fights. It's really important actually in fights versus level nine boards because Kog'Maw would be able to reach things like Huey and Irelia very quickly and sometimes even beat those level nine boards. The biggest downside of Kog'Maw is that it's pretty expensive for a one cost reroll because you're rolling for Kog'Maw three and ideally Cho three and Caitlyn three, Malphite three. But there's no other people usually rerolling one cost. They're not pulling out the one cost and making your rolls more efficient. So try to play Kog'Maw if you have like an early Kog'Maw 2 and you have good items for Kog'Maw. Blue buff's the only thing that's core. You can justify a bunch of other stuff on Kog'Maw otherwise. And uh, you have like a really good reroll augment like too much candy or it's a portal that really encourages you to do so. Very straightforward comp and when you get online can just cruise very easily to a top two top three if you're able to hit on curve if you're new to tft and you're looking for like an easy comp to kind of understand i would probably recommend playing something like Kog'Maw. just make sure you don't nuke your economy too much just save your economy and then roll above 50 because you need to hit a bunch of one cost three stars seven ink shadow is surprisingly really good this got majorly buffed uh on the a patch 14.7 uh, the damage reduction and the bonus got increased by a lot and the ink shadow items got buffed themselves we listed out who would be holding out each of the these tattoos depending on what you hit but you're not going to get all of these every single game so just mix and match accordingly so for example if you get tattoo of toxin you don't need red buff on kaisa and you can just go like tattoo of toxin last whisper ie or if you get like you know fury and toxin uh you could probably just go like last whisper so you have the shred and the two damage amplifications so just kind of like you know critically think based off of what items you get and read <laughs> it's a lot of reading with ink shadow because you have to kind of think about what you want to do with it but hopefully this guide helps get you started the thing about ink shadow is that you really need the plus one ink shadow you can't really play seven without it i mean you literally can't uh there's only six of them so you definitely need it and you also need to hit udir so it's kind of tough uh to get there but i do promise you if you can get to a state where you hit seven ink shadow it's actually quite solid and then the other thing too is for ghostly is a lot of times what you play for a big portion of the early mid and even late stages of the game but I will say, uh, late game, you do end up replacing Shen and Alawi for higher tier units, usually like Orn to complement Udir and then another really strong five cost. So uh, just play really high quality units around this. Usually it's Zaya actually with Kaisa for the trick shot. Zoe reroll is quite good, but it's not very popular in at least North America. It is a lot more popular in China and SEA because they really like rolling around Diana 3, Soraka 3, and Zoe 3. The only problem with this is it's super hard to hit. I think the reason why more people don't play it is because People are taking Soraka because her traits are just insane and every comp is trying to play it heavenly or fast nine. And Diana is an incredibly popular splash as well in the mid stages of the game when you want to roll for Diana and duelists are going to be taking Diana. So it's just really hard to actually hit. But if you do, the power level of this composition can actually just steamroll a lot of other comps that aren't prepared for it. So give it a try. I personally am a big believer in Zoe. I have yet to bot four with her on the patch playing with her, both on the A and B patch. So you know, if you're able to get a spot where you're able to reroll for Zoe, I promise you it actually can be really good. If you do end up getting something like Call to Adventure, you can actually kind of ditch this altruist heavenly version and play vertical uh, Story Weaver as well. Um, so that's like another variant that you can play, but just keep that in mind. Uh, Zoe really just cares about the mana and the AP burst. Morello is interchangeable between her and Soraka, so it could be Deathcap Zoe and Morello so Soraka or vice versa. And make sure that you're positioning Diana correctly because she does have a hex radius where she is taking reduced damage from. So don't have her too close to some of those range units. Otherwise, it's going to be dangerous. Diana got buffed as well, which is partially why I think people are trying it out. It's very good if you can hit. Bard is rebuffed or reverted from his nerf. He got an attack speed reduction from 0.8 to 0.75, which doesn't sound like a big deal. Until you realize that 0.05 attack speed is like almost everything that Bard wants. Bard wants double rage blade for a reason, right? Because he wants more attack speed. So slower attack speed means slower scaling on one rage blade, which is a really big deal because you don't really get two rage blades that quickly. But if you have one rage blade, you're scaling that much slower, which means you're throwing that many fewer beeps, which means that you're dealing that much less damage, uh, which is healing your Tom Kench less, 
which all kind of feeds into itself. It's like this one giant uh, recursive loop that, you know, Bard and Tom Kent are feeding each other. And uh, that's a really, really big deal. So Bard's stats were so bad that Riot decided to rebuff Bard back to his original values. And that actually means that Bard is okay now. Towards the end of the last patch, people started realizing Bard was not that good because of the ghostly that was giving it time to stall out or even Yone to assassinate Bard. And so people stopped playing Bard a lot towards the end of the patch. Bard, in the words of Mordog, is like a low elo noob stomper, which is... Kind of true, but a little bit rude. Didn't have to say it like that. <laughs> and yet another comp, by the way, that takes Zoe and Soraka. So going back to why Zoe Reroll is pretty uncommon, but if you can hit it, it's really good. The Outrist version is really superior. Don't play the Mythic version of Bard. And Double Rage Blade is really good, but if you do have a Radiant Rage Blade, you could probably go for something else like Radiant Rage Blade, Gun Blade, plus, you know, damage item, for example. Roll on seven, seven for three costs, uh, so on and so forth. Very straightforward comp. Starting off B tier, we got something a little spicier, which is Arcanists. Arcanists are quite dynamic. They aren't supposed to just be like luxury roll, although that's some of the most common that you'll see because you could actually play Arcanist in a couple different ways. You could play it like uh, stabilize on Lux 2, Zoe 2, push for Syndra and find Lissandra, then print a bunch of items and play for like high cost legendaries. And that means you can scale off of six Arcanists late game and lean more into like porcelain or just transition Arcanist entirely into AP fast nine which is a different thing entirely you can also just re-roll and stay on lux and go for a moomoo three a Lowy three so there's a lot of different variations that you can play and it all kind of depends on like what traits you're hitting and how much econ you have if you're able to hit some of these really powerful arcanist uh, augments like you know mind over matter and jewel lotus three boiling point these are really powerful augments that can help uh your moomoo stay alive forever and if you have a moomoo with arcanist crest it actually pops off pretty decently so give it a try positioning does kind of depend on like if you're hitting sets if you have redemption if you have like other things like that if you have spark versus shiv red buff is also surprisingly really good that's why we have bow on a carousel priority like you know what do you do with bows just make red buff instead of morello but yeah there's a lot of different variations to play arcanist it's still pretty new the thing about arcanist is it has so much high potential but it also has a really high chance of going eighth so the average of this comp is probably like a 4.6 that's because you're gonna go seventh and then second and then eighth and then first and then sixth and then third so uh just keep in mind that arcanist have high volatility to it six ghostly flex is a lot weaker now they nerfed the the amount of damage done by the specters from I believe 20% is uh, the overall damage nerf to six ghostly, but you still could play it and it is flexible, right? You don't have to play around Kaisa. Kaisa is just one way you can capitalize on the burst of ghostly, but you could also play around Ash. Ash got buffed. So you could do instead of Kaisa and Zaya and Seth, you could play uh, Ash and Amumu plus, um, you know, Caitlyn as a sniper. So you can do a lot of different variations of it. If you get a bunch of AP items, you could also play Syndra with Set and like Ari and then go into more Arcanists. So you have a lot of different variations you can play, which are very fun. I wouldn't play it though without a Ghostly plus one. I just think that you need to be ahead of curve. So you want to hit four Ghostly very quickly in the mid game and you want to hit six Ghostly very quickly in stage four. It is something you think about playing if you have like a Senna opener and you're just like, okay, I'm contested and you're looking around and you're like, oh my God, Kaisa is not going to be available either. Or I keep getting a bunch of AP items. Think about playing around six Ghostly, you could. It's just no longer as uh, easy of free top four as it was before. Ash. Ash, Ash, Ash. What are we going to do with Ash? Uh, she's supposed to be better than B tier. She got a 580 buff, which is huge. But she, for some reason, still feels very unreliable. I think it's because Ash 1 just doesn't do anything. Like, if you hit Ash 1 on your roll down and you're going up against reroll comps that have like Volibear 3, Thresh 3, you're just going to not kill anything. And even if you have Ash 2, she sometimes barely gets past frontline just in time for her to be the last alive versus five units so ash still needs a little bit of extra that being said some of the augments around ash are filthy like boiling point is still really insane it's kind of like giving ash red buff and shojin so it's like giving her plus two items so there are some sets around ash that are really good also ash ends up being kind of a consistent unit to play around with a giant fortune cash out because a lot of things can link into Ash with Exalted, as well as uh, giving you a reliable item holder to play temporarily until nine. Because when you're playing Fortune, a lot of times you're rolling to stabilize as fast as you can. And because Ash is uncontested, you end up hitting Ash 2 and maybe like an Annie 2 very quickly. Use that to get to nine and then uh, transition your board. But overall, I would say Ash is still the weakest four cost to like, play around consistently uh, alongside Lilia. So uh, try her if you get an opener for it. I usually only play it if I get like a porcelain angle, but um hey 
maybe she ends up being pretty good. Oh, actually, one thing I didn't say is that you could actually play Ash as a Faded Emblem holder. Ends up being kind of good. In fact, uh, while I'm just here, I'll just say it. Uh, Faded Emblem is probably pretty good on Ord, Ash, uh, Lissandra, and maybe even Udyr. So... Uh, Ash can actually pop off in those scenarios where maybe you have her in other traits, just not when she's the primary carry, when she's the secondary. Janna. Janna has turned into a hero augment reroll where her hero augment is Enter the Dragon. Enter the Dragon is really good for this composition. And if you get a plus one Dragon Lord emblem of some kind, it's also really good. Just put on like Sorak or something like that and just watch her bonus true damage go crazy to get her three stars. But Janna is pretty rare and you're not really supposed to play her unless you have like a perfect item setup. Usually what ends up happening with Janna is you open up a completed item anvil there's like a rage blade in and then there's like a second rage blade you can make immediately and you're thinking oh it's bard and then on your way to play bard you're like wait i have janna too i can just play janna reroll that's a lot of times like how you end up getting into janna and from a very safe spot where it feels clean if you open up janna too immediately and you're like playing like a single rage blade on her or like a single archangels she ends up like not doing a lot and you end up losing by a ton of units while being down on the economy so just be very careful if you're like i have janna pair i'm holding Janna too. I have like a single rage blade, but I'm playing like one star story weavers and everything else. That's usually how you go away with this comp. Kabuko got buffed a lot and then he got nerfed a lot. And now Kabuko is in an okay spot. I think he's pretty balanced, but because how conditional he is and how much you need to go right, like you need to hit Kabuko quickly um, at stage three so you can have him scale faster and you need to make sure you hit him with a certain amount of gold and you want to hit things like good bruiser based augments. It's going to be kind of tricky to get Kabuko to a win. Before the B patch, he was actually kind of a tear. He was averaging like a 3.9. Now he's like a 4.5. He's all right. Kind of sad, actually, because I really liked Kabuko doing well. He's kind of a meme comp, but he is a snowball champion. So I think the frustration of going up against Kabuko is that they're high rolling. You just couldn't kill him at all. He scales off of HP, so Warmog's Redemption is really good, and you give him a Dragon's Claw. The back line that statistically does the best is the Sage with Morgana and Zyra, but you can also play Kaisa plus Zaya if you want, uh, or Kaisa and Sivir, so you can get that Story Weaver. Pretty straightforward of a one-cost reroll, and I would definitely go for it if I have early Kabukos and Belts, as well as other people are rerolling like Kogma for for example, uh, pulling out a bunch of one cost. Rex I3 is not important, but a bruiser is very, very good if you can get it. Speaking of hero augments, we got Shen, and Shen is kind of like rage blade checks, attack speed checks, as well as a combination of raid boss and ethereal blades. If you get raid boss and ethereal blades, you probably just like top two the game for free but if you're able to get shen into a pretty good spot with six behemoths and rush that usually you end up cruising to a top four tempo matters a ton that means hitting shen too early that means getting three items on shen quickly that means getting six behemoth online fast also worth noting that the three two augment of behemoth plus way better than two one because you get that shen two immediately and you're much more likely to hit shen three basically they brought back headliners and chosen with the hero augments on three two because if you get it at three two you just get so many copies of it it's like hitting heroic grab bag and the hero augment at the same time very, very insane. You can jump straight into Yorick Hero Augment. It's the same thing in terms of the principle of it. The tempo matters a lot. How fast you hit, how fast you get items. But instead of playing around Behemoths, you're playing around the Umbral and trying to get to Yone, which is, you know, good luck with that. If you hit <laughs> Yone 3 and Yone on curve, you are probably the biggest high roll in the server. Yorick scales off of HP as well. So given kind of the Kabuko items, Warmogs, Dragon Claw, Redemption, uh, make sure you position him thoughtfully because you don't want him to get Lissandra. You don't want him to get stunned and Mana Reed. You want him to get good value off of his cast. But if you're playing Yone too, just play like Kane support, Morgana, and Silas. Like you have enough damage sources through these four units that you should be able to get it done most of the time. And if you combine it with Raid Boss, you're probably going to uh, top two. Lilia is probably the weakest four cost in the game right now, mainly because her identity as an AP nuker just gets outperformed by uh, pretty much anybody. Like Hui One is better than her. And then all the three costs are better than her. I mean, heck, I'd probably even play Lux Two over Lilia right now because of how inconsistent Lilia is. And not to mention Lilia is kind of a positioning nightmare because of her... Um, bowling ball thingy like her ability cast and like spreads out and you kind of need to like you know triangulate and use your advanced trigonometry lessons to like figure out how to hit back on even one time so lilia is less consistent she can still pop off but usually this is the board you play to get to Hui Azir. So the reason why this is B tier is because you're probably stuck on eights or you got to nine and you couldn't transition. 
the full board and so you're just stuck playing Lilia with mythics and invokers pretty decent though if you're able to play ahead of curve and any two is kind of an animal so if you hit any two you really can anchor this comp really well and it's not like it can't do well it's just just in general the least consistent and it's so expensive like look at how many fours and five cost there is and you still might just barely get fourth to the reroll compositions it's just it's just not worth it in the same way heavenly warriors is basically like what you play if you don't hit yone this is like the board that you're often going for with the exception of maybe instead of Orn and Morgana, you're playing two Reapers like Kindred and Yone instead. But you're basically playing around like Wukong, Kane, and maybe like Lee Sin slash Morgana slash whoever else you can get as your second slash third carry. And you're just relying on the fact that Heavenly as a trait is really OP. So just aim for this variation if you're not hitting your Yones or if you just want to be spicy, right? Let's say you hit, you know, the Heavenly Crest and Gargantuan Resolve and you're hitting a bunch of reasons to level and you're just like Yone super contested. You're like, yeah, I'll just play Heavenly Warriors, Kane, Lee Sin duo and give it a try. Also, shout out to Build a Bud. Sometimes you get like Malphite 3 or Kha'Zix 3 and you just push levels because you get the Heavenly Star level stuff. Pretty cool. Nar Center reroll is not as good as it was in PBE, and it just feels like inferior to Center reroll, but you can play it. A lot of times you end up going for this when you have a lot of Nars and you hit something like Mulched or you're playing Wandering Trainer, you get like a plus one Dryad, you're tempoing out. This composition purely aims for to land in the top four. I, I think the highest I've ever seen it got this set so far is third. And that's, you know, because they're playing like NAR too early with BT Titans. And they're like, hey, like, it's probably not going to be Yone or Duelists. It's probably going to be NAR instead. I mean, part of the reason why it's so awkward is that NAR doesn't even use any of the Ink Shadows like that well. A lot of times you're looking for like a Ink Shadow item on Senna and the good defensive ones go on Aatrox. So yeah, you're really not playing this that often, but hey, it's another out to play for if a bunch of people are taking your lines. Let's say you slam BT Titans. You get offered Nars, you look at Yone, Yone is super contested, you look at Duelist, Duelist is super contested, you hit a bunch of Senna's. Okay, like maybe I'll just go into this. That's one way you can play it. Last but not least, let's breeze through C tier. Not too much to talk about because uh, they suck, but you know, situationally they can pop off. So <laughs> let's go into the times where you can play it. Fade Yasuo, Ari, Yasuo got giga nerfed. They kneecapped a lot of his scaling with resistances. So before it was kind of solid B if you could get it, but that's because Yasuo 2 was so broken. Now Yasuo 3 is basically as good as what Yasuo 2 was last patch. But if you can get the right items onto him, it's really strong. It's also a fun way to play because Ari ends up being a scaler you don't really play like you know the shoujin nashers uh cast you give her like rage blade and a bunch of utility and watch yasuo go to town but in the end you're still trying to play around seven faded which is also another thing you have to hit yasuo three re three get good items and get like you know set or a faded plus one it's kind of hard to get ghostly kindred was a build that actually started getting a lot of attention towards the end of last patch because people thought kindred was the worst carry in the game and they found ways to play her that being said the ghostly does end up ramping kindred's damage a lot and so if you're able to spike get blue buff for kindred early itemize a shen 3 and then find a way to get into faded but fourth ghostly while not struggling on the mid game kindred can actually do a lot of work there's also a variation of kindred being played with seven faded kind of like fusing this build with this build of uh the faded Yasuo Ari and then just kind of playing like this setup uh of Kindred Carry and watching her pop off and land in the top four I'm not sure if I'm a full believer on it but uh it's something you can play every now and then and some people have posted like on Reddit and other forums about how they climbed like diamond with this so uh we'll throw it on there because it's a comp that does exist not that consistent though oh also the one thing I want to say is that uh part of the reason what makes Kindred so hard is that uh Yone wants Kindred and Faded wants Kindred so a lot of times you're just not going to hit Kindred 3 you're adjacently contested so it's just very very difficult to hit reliably Timo is basically the same as Janna in that he needs a specific augment as his hero augment, and that's too healthy. If you don't have too healthy, I would not recommend playing around Timo. Uh, Timo with all this AP and blue buffs nonsense is only really good if you have the HP to stall for it so that Timo can lucky ricochet and backline kill. If you do get too healthy and like lucky ricochet, you can actually win the game. It's just really, really hard to get there. You also just like stay on six and roll forever. And if you get to seven, maybe you add in like Yorick. But yeah, otherwise, Timo is like one of the best item holders in the game. Like, one and two star Teemo are insane. They get you to level eight and level nine pretty consistently. But three star Teemo, 
I'm not sure what happened. Uh, just, maybe they nerfed him a little bit too much before launch. Nico Hero Augman, I think, is uh, significantly worse than the other ones, but she still has more exploration. I think a lot of people don't know how to play the mythic version of Nico very well. They try a bunch of other stuff, like maybe try Heavenly, maybe they try Arcanist. I think Mythic is the best. It gives her the most amount of stats for her to scale and hit backline. I think her ability itself is inconsistent because she heals more and she increases the cast size, but I don't think it's exactly like the one radius expansion people think it is sometimes it like misses or like it doesn't hit i'm not entirely sure what it, what's going on but uh, i think she has the most room to improve it wouldn't surprise me if she makes the b tier by the end of this patch right now i recommend playing around mythic titans bt archangels is really good uh and just roll on six to hit nico with uh mythic early and then scale it another variation you can play with nico is i combined this with zoe reroll basically instead of diana three i played nico three and i scammed the top four so there are other variants of nico probably out there but definitely experiment and keep an open mind if lp does not matter to you garen hero augment definitely the worst hero augment of them all story champion is basically like the weakest variation that you can play of seven story weaver uh if you do end up playing it try to just go for zyra three and juice up that zyra a lot so we're going triple blue here zyra is actually secretly very good might be one of the most underrated three stars of the set she can actually uh do a lot of really clutch end game fights when there's like one super tank and one carry i'm thinking like a tom kench and a bard where tom kench and bard are the only two units alive zyra's plants will aim at both of them sometimes we'll just kill that bard and then give you time for things like garen and zyra to work on that tom kench so give it a try if you don't care too much about lp i will say it's probably better if you see people chasing like yasuo kabuko and uh kogma but uh, I did end up winning a game with this augment, but um, it was against players from OC, so uh, you be the judge of that. Kha'Zix Reroll is the weakest comp in the game. Why would you play this? Probably because you hit build a bud and you hit Kha'Zix 3, or you're uh, a one-trick D-Gen player that just loves to get uh, assassinations on the back line as much as you can. Not really something to really think about. Why not just play Yone instead of this? Yone 2 is already better than Kha'Zix 3. In fact, I'm pretty sure Yone 1 might be better than Kha'Zix 3 with these items. It's entirely possible that Kha'Zix 3 Malphite 3, you hit it so fast and you push levels, you get to 9, you play Wukong Rakan, and then you like Kha'Zix top 4 or top 2 even. But uh, those are really rare. So yeah, don't really advise playing this very often. But it's a comp and our tier list should have as much as we can of it. So someone has to be last place. So there you have it. The tier list for 14.7 on TFTAcademy.com. There's probably going to be even more comps that we haven't even listed. There's variations of things like Build Different, for example, or Arcanist that we haven't included. But one thing's for sure, if it is a relevant comp it'll be updated pretty quickly so uh, thanks for watching this video and i'll see you guys next time